This is Pen Dust Radio. Welcome, all you literati, you lovers of words and tales, you who need a break in your hurried, harried lives. We have a salve for your soul with stories imaginative and original. Short stories, riveting fiction, and wildly creative nonfiction. Pen Dust Radio. Definitely not the same old story. Please visit us at pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. We publish literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. This eloquent and poignant short story about redemption and forgiveness is told through the eyes of Sarah, who remembers her childhood growing up on a tomato ranch. It begins when she opens an old photo album and a horseshoe-shaped belt buckle tumbles onto her lap. She recalls that there was nothing lucky at all about that particular keepsake and relives the momentous events of one particular summer that she called the Summer of the River Bottom Dragon. Jennifer O'Neill Pickering's prose appears in numerous literary journals and is featured in audio recordings at Writers on the Air and Restore and Restory, a people's history of the Cache Creek Nature Preserve. She is the host of Prose in the Afternoon at the Sacramento Poetry Center, a finalist in the New Women's Voices Competition, and a pushcart nominee for poetry. She is the author of Fruit Box Castles, Poems from a Peach Rancher's Daughter. This is a work of fiction. Summer of the River Bottom Dragon. Written by Jennifer O'Neill Pickering. Read by Rebecca Nemethy. I got up from my easy chair and walked to the bookcase. I reached for the old, worn, leather-bound photo album and sat down again. As I turned its fragile pages to my favorite photograph, a belt buckle in the shape of a horseshoe fell onto my lap. I held it, feeling the weight of it in my hand. There was nothing lucky about this keepsake, or the story it kept. I slipped it back into its yellowed sleeve. On the opposite page was the photograph of me, on my Sears and Roebuck bike, wearing a cowgirl hat, and Jake, my younger brother, wearing one too. Jake was trying to lasso Nugget, our golden retriever. Dad leaned against the John Deere tractor, with three inches of mud on its tires, grinning from under the brim of a straw hat. Mama smiled, too, looking like Rosie the Riveter, her thick, blonde, permed hair escaping a bandana. They seemed so happy, arms linked like they just jumped from a Norman Rockwell painting. Had Grandma photographed them with the little brownie camera she'd been so proud of? The black and white photographs were of the time before my sister Lola and brother Benny were born, when my family lived in a place called Farmlands, in a high-water bungalow on a tomato ranch. Nobody smiled the day Jake and I with Mama, who carried the beginnings of Lola, our younger sister, in her belly, walked that dusty road to use the telephone at the Smith's house. The telephone cable hadn't been installed yet for our tomato ranch. Daddy said we'd get a phone after the crop came in. That day, a green garter snake jolted me from my thoughts. It slid smooth as taffy across the hot, dusty road, melting into the tomato field's cool canopy. I didn't point it out. From a tumbled down barn, a mourning dove cooed to its mate. A dark shadow floated overhead blocking the sun, and shadows darkened the rutted road. My life had changed. I felt confused and afraid and lagged behind, stopping to pick up chocolate clods from the side of the dirt road and flung them haphazardly into the air. Mama called, Sarah, hurry it up now. I looked back down the road and saw our high water bungalow grow smaller and smaller, then turned, racing in front of her, Breathless, I skidded to a stop. 
Planting my hands on my hips, I asked. Why do we need to use the Smith's phone? Mama snapped back. Because your daddy's run off to Mexico with my best friend, that's why. I watched her bite her lips, and fresh tears rolled down her face. I'm sorry, Sarah. Reaching her hands towards me, but I wouldn't take them. And she continued down the road. Mama barely had time to feel bad about talking to her daughter in that way. It was anger that should have been directed at her husband. Damn him anyway, she cursed under her breath, allowing her anger to mop up her tears. I went silent, looking down at my feet as if they were the most interesting books in the library. Quick tears burned my own eyes and trickled down my freckled cheeks. Mama's best friend was Mia. She had two daughters, May and Lydia. Mia's older daughter, May, often babysat us when the grown-ups went out to Ralston Corners to dance. Lydia was a few years older than I and could ride her bike with no hands. She'd promised to show me how to perform the same trick the next time we got together. When I now thought of Daddy, it was with a mixture of love, fear, and pain. Why would he leave with Mia and her children? Was he their daddy now? I thought of last summer as the river bottom dragon summer. It was a period when five important things happened in my life. It was the summer of the fishing and swimming lessons at Buck's Lake, my first sighting of the river bottom dragon, berry picking, and my bicycle ride to the Rockella's house. At the lake, Dad had shown me how to bait and hook with Velveeta cheese. He helped me make a proper cast and even let me wear his lucky fisherman's cap. I wore it backward and it slipped down over my eyes. I hadn't seen that he'd hooked a trout until he called out, Hey, looky here, Sarah. He held up the net with a flip-flopping rainbow trout that would be fried in Mama's black cast iron skillet for dinner. On the second day of the fishing trip, the outboard motor sputtered and then gave out halfway to shore. Daddy offered me one of the wooden oars and said, All hands on deck. I need you to help me get this ship to shore, and you're just the mate for the job. I'd paddled hard, and my hands afterward wore badges of cherry blisters. Dad also had been teaching me to swim on that lake trip. I always wore layers for fishing, swimsuit under my shorts or jeans, and a long-sleeved shirt and saltwater sandals for easy swimming later. After another morning of fishing, he cut the engine, glided into the shore, and said, Hey, Sarah, how about another swimming lesson? And he threw me kicking and hollering overboard. Swim, Sarah, you can do it. Swim, girl, the way I showed you. And I had, flapping my arms like a baby bird, kicking my legs hard, swallowing so much water that it made me choke. I was so intent on not drowning, I didn't notice that I could touch the bottom until my foot hit a rock. Mama stood on the pebbly shore, a nervous smile on her face. She held open the beach towel, probably thinking it was the cold water that had set my teeth chattering, and not the betrayal of daddy. Aw, oh, come on, Sarah, we weren't going to let you drown, he called out as I stomped off down the beach toward the cabin. Fear already turned to anger and hurt. I was determined not to let daddy see me cry. I learned to be a strong swimmer last summer and to distrust my daddy at the same time. I looked up from my dusty shoes and kicked at an imaginary rock as we walked along the road to the Smiths. It was taking forever to get to their ranch. Mama was way ahead on the road, wiping sweat from her face with a wet bandana. She walked slower these days, swaying side to side as if she carried a bag of groceries. I turned in the opposite direction of Mama, shading my eyes with my hand, looking toward the lazy, meandering river. From the levee sprang spikes of yellow star thistle. I looked slowly left and right until I found the lone oak that seemed to hold up heaven with its massive limbs. It was there, last summer, on the 4th of July, that I first glimpsed the river bottom dragon. I shuddered, imagining that the dragon was now waking up, opening its big, gaping mouth in a yawn, making its own hot wind. Mama had said the dragon lived hidden in the tulis and pampas grass during the day. Daddy, in a deep voice, bellowed that it had two enormous green eyes as large as summer watermelons. To make its meals, 
it hunted little children at night. It was said the dragon fattened them on biscuits and sweet milk, put them on a spit, and barbecued them with its breath. Last summer on the 4th of July, Jake and I, along with two cousins, Rosa Lee and Ben, climbed the levee and saw the dragon. There was a full buck moon that lit up the bric-a-brac outline of the dragon's dancing tail. Seeing its fiery breath spew sparks into the darkness, we all shrieked and raced down the levee. Little Jake let go of my hand and tumbled into the masses of yellow thistle. Afterwards, the palms of Jake's hands were pin cushions of yellow needles. We got blamed for breaking up a poker game with aunt and uncle so mama could tend to Jake's hand. We almost didn't get to eat watermelon or to light sparklers as we always did on this holiday. But daddy, his breath sweet with wine, had given me a hug and winked instead of getting mad, saying how we were adventurers just like him. I thought of this and my little brother's hands and winced. In late August, and over a month after seeing the dragon, Mama said it was time to harvest the blackberries. Usually, Grandma went with Mama on the expedition, but her rheumatism was ornery. So to my surprise, Mama said, get a good night's sleep, Sarah, because we're going to get up early to pick blackberries. The ruby red of the early summer berries had turned the purple color of Thanksgiving wine, and they were sugary sweet. I remembered that summer morning held the promise of fall in the air. We drove to the berry patch on the levee road. Mama made sure I wore long sleeves, gave me a pair of thick gloves. White-tailed mule deer followed the river down from the hills to feast on the berries, making trails through the thickets. Mama said, Sarah, we'll follow in the deer's lead. She showed me how to gather the berries without becoming scratched by the plant's barbed arms. The blackberries wouldn't take us prisoner or leave scratches while trying to. By noon, before the heat set in, our buckets were full and we headed home. Mama made big fluffy biscuits from Grandma's recipe for berry shortcake. Daddy helped me whip the cream with Mama's electric sunbeam mixer. Then the whole family sat in the yard under the black walnut tree and ate dessert in the cool of the evening. It was Daddy's favorite dessert. A week later, after the berry picking, I decided to visit my best friend, Maria, before we started back to school. I had so much to share with her about my summer. So I decided to ride the three miles to the Raquelis house where she lived. I'd done this once before without telling mama or daddy and been told not to ride that far again without first getting permission. Mama was off to town with Jake and grandma to buy him a pair of school shoes and daddy was out in the far field with the tractor taken apart. I figured I'd get to the Raquelas and come home before anybody knew better. Their house was set back from the slaughterhouse slough. You had to cross the slough over a rickety slatted wood bridge to get to their place. The slough filled up fast with water when the river overflowed from rains or when farmers released water to irrigate the orchards and fields. You never knew when this could be, and there were danger signs posted after the little Mackenzie girl drowned there last year. Blackberry thickets grew along the slough, down its banks. If I walked too close, the blackberry vines might take hold of me. They might take me prisoner like they had the Raquelas colt that had gotten separated from her mama. The coyotes would have finished her off if Mr. Raquela had not scared them away with blasts from his rifle. I knocked on the door, and Maria's grandma shuffled out to meet me. She was a small woman bent over like a sapling in a strong wind. I feared she'd tip over. Nobody a la casa, she said, flashing a mouth of shiny gold teeth. A la ciudad. If I hadn't ridden over the sharp rock in the road, blown a tire, skidded down the embankment into the murky slough, I wouldn't have gotten home late. If I hadn't slid down the slough bank two more times before managing to pull myself and the bike to the top of the road, nobody would have been the wiser. The rest of that afternoon was a memory that played in my mind many times, like a scary picture show. Now walking to the Smith's house, the memory of that bicycle ride and what happened afterward made me glad daddy was now Mia's kid's daddy. That was the afternoon he dragged me out behind the barn, so I'd never go to the Raquelas house without telling mama again. 
Mama, more mad than worried, said to Daddy, I can't leave her alone with you for a minute. But she didn't stop Daddy from teaching me a lesson. She just kept sweeping the kitchen floor, even though you could already eat dinner off it. It took forever for him to take off his belt. Sarah, this is going to hurt me more than you. That was the first time I realized Daddy was a liar. I'd already counted up to ten by the time he unbuckled his belt with that lucky horseshoe on it. With the first lash, I imagined shrinking as small as the rat who'd chewed a hole through the white peeling paint of the barn in front of me. By the second lash, my eyes smarted, and I tried to focus on the hole. By the third, I tried to fit through it and was crying out. But as hard as I tried, I'd never be small enough to fit through that hole. Daddy stopped after three lashes, and through my pain I heard him holler, Go get with your mama, girl. I moved as fast as my smarting legs allowed. I stopped once as I heard him cry out and turned around and froze. He coiled up the belt like a rattlesnake before it strikes and threw it into the muddy field. Then he slumped to his knees as if he was in prayer and hammered the anvil of the earth with his fists. Mama's cold cloth was no comfort to my legs that looked as if they had stepped on a wasp's nest instead of out of line. That night, Mama and Daddy fought with fists of words. Later, the screen door slamming woke me from sleep. I wiped fog from the window pane and watched him climb into the cab of the pickup. It coughed and coughed again, and then the engine caught. I heard the gears whine and watched Daddy chug down the rutted road. I watched until the taillights were extinguished by the night. From then on, I thought of him as the bad daddy. Something had cast a mean spell on him. The next day, I found the belt in the field. I took Mama's clippers and cut the buckle from the belt and buried the leather strap under the ancient oak tree as a gesture to the dragon. I placed the lucky buckle in my keepsake box. Daddy came home after a few days, and I wouldn't look him in the eye. I wouldn't accept his hug, and I wouldn't be his girl. I found a stick in the ditch by the road and whipped it in the air, erasing these thoughts from my mind. Mama still walked in the distance, looking small as a paper doll. The stick in my hand had become a magic wand. I imagined the river bottom dragon and my bad daddy. I commanded the dragon to flap its wings down to Mexico and swallow the bad daddy. I imagined seeing the dragon's green belly stretch in all directions as daddy tried to escape, but I commanded the dragon to not ever let him loose. After a time, the dragon returned, spewing a cloud of gray that dusted the tomato field. Then the dragon lifted its great span of wings, stirring up dust tornadoes on the road. It flew toward its nest in the river bottom, a tiny speck in the indigo sky. I felt something grab my backside, and that made me jump from the daydream. It was Jake, who, by the looks of his red caked shoes, had been in the mud. Mama would be mad because he'd track mud into the Smith's house. We'd been walking a long time toward the Smith's. We rounded a curve in the road and the two-story pillar house rose up like a castle from an orchard of English walnuts, the tree trunks wearing skirts of white paint. I hoped Mrs. Smith would offer us her saucer-sized sugar cookies, as she often did. Mama called out, we are almost there. Come on, slowpokes, take hold of my hands. She stretched out her strong, tan arms like a crucifix. I tossed the stick into the ditch beside the road. Last one there is a rotten egg. I had already decided to let my little brother win the race. I held the album to my heart and listened to my dad's labored breath that the cancer stole a little more each day. The bad daddy was gone forever, swallowed by the dragon and my childhood magic. That daddy wasn't the same one who slept on my couch. I slipped the album back into the bookcase. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pen Dust Radio. 
For more information or to submit your writing to the podcast, please visit pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. The story featured in this episode is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are the products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events, locales, or persons, living or dead, is entirely coincidental. 